but uh, I'd be glad to help you out. If you have any trouble, just let me know. Looking at the announcements for the upcoming a uh, few periods. We've got uh, homework nine due on Wednesday, and I've got a couple of pretty detailed hints to give you on that assignment today. And then phase two, which is your first submission of the pipe sizing in the project, is due on Friday. So today we're going to continue talking about chapter 12 related topics. I'll again put in a plug for reading through the book because I think the author does a really nice job of uh, succinctly expressing a lot of information. You know, too many technical books just go on and on and on, but ours is actually relatively compact for the ground that it covers. They just get straight to the point. So, you know, I'll go on and on in class here, but take the author's secondary point of view to better understand some of these concepts as well. Any uh, schedule or announcement questions before we get into the hints for the next homework assignment? Okay. Problem 22 is a rectangular channel that has a step up and a step down. And you're asked to find what are the new depths after the uh, step either up or down. And what I wanted to remind you is the definition of flow per unit width. And so lowercase q is flow per unit width. And that can be either calculated with the volumetric flow rate divided by the channel width b. And this only applies for our rectangular channel or you can multiply the velocity by the depth and you can get the flow per unit width. And then if it's a rectangular channel, you can calculate the critical depth using this formula. And that's useful because you can diagnose the flow regime once you know the critical depth. And also the critical depth is uh, valuable in determining whether the, uh, the downstream depth is gonna increase or decrease. Okay, so Keep that in mind, these definitions for rectangular channels. And now specific energy, when you've got a step up, this delta Z step up is reducing the amount of specific energy that's available at two. So the way to read this equation is that the energy at one minus the delta Z equals the energy at two. Now I've intentionally expressed the velocity head at location one in terms of V, because they give you that V. So I think it'll be most useful for you to calculate the velocity head in terms of the given velocity at one. But then at two, you are gonna know the flow per unit width, but you're not gonna know the depth at two. So this is maybe a new way to see the velocity head, because I think before you already knew, for example, velocity head is v squared divided by 2g. And you also know that it's q squared divided by 2g a squared. I've shared this one with you before. But maybe this next one is new. Flow per unit width squared divided by 2g y squared. So I mean, all we've done is we've taken the flow rate and taken out the B term, you know, for a rectangular channel, um, area <coughs> is B times Y, B times Y. So if we take the B out of the area and we divide the flow rate by B, then it's flow per unit width. So in this particular problem, you're going to be solving for the unknown depth downstream after the step up with this specific energy uh, equation. And we've just basically kept track of how much energy is taken out of the specific energy between one and two for a step up. Okay, so solve for y2. And then for the step down, oh, I'm sorry. There was one other aspect of this. They ask you in the problem, actually, what is the change in the water depth? And so you have to calculate y2 to find the change in the water depth. And so the change in the water depth is there was the initial water depth at one, and then you subtract the new depth plus delta Z, because they want to know basically um, the, this, you, you, you see how the water kind of has gotten shallower, like this curvature at the top of the water surface. They want to know basically what's happening to the water surface, not just what's the new depth. 
So you'll need both Y2 and the difference between the upstream, the downstream, and taking into account the delta Z. So that's what they mean by change in part A. Now in part B, things are different. Instead of minus delta Z for a step up, if there's a step down, that's adding specific energy from 1 to 2. So it's a plus delta Z if it's a step down. And the same process as before, you're going to get a discrete number on the left-hand side of this because V is a known, it's a given. Y at 1 is a given. Delta Z is a given. So you've got a, an actual number on the left-hand side of the equation. And the only unknown on the right-hand side of the equation is going to be Y2. And then here, the, uh, the change that they're talking about will be the original depth minus the depth minus delta Z because it's a step down. So again, they want to see this little deflection where the water depth is increasing. They want to know what is the magnitude of that vertical deflection in the water depth. Okay, so that's problem 22. And now on problem 25, it is a question related to um, expansions. And you know, actually now that I think about it, I am going to call an audible here and I'm going to just only, only problem 22 is due on Wednesday because I'd like for us to take a little more time for uh, problems 25 and 27. So uh, homework 7 only 12.22. And uh, I think that you'll be better served doing this problem maybe with the next batch. So everybody understand that? You got a single problem due on Wednesday. And I've just given you step by step how to do it. Okay. A slow clap? Yeah. Yeah, I've had those before. <laughs> hey, yeah, all right. <laughs> no, no, you should never, never applaud someone for lowering their expectations. <laughs> it's not lowered expectations, I guess, necessarily. It's just um, we fell a little bit behind when we took some extra time um, with water gems. We did one additional water gems hands-on than normally I would do, and so... We're trying to play catch up, so anyways, thanks for the applause. It felt good. All right. So we'll go over this hint uh, later. All right, so we've just talked about a step up, and you can think of the energy at location one as being how much energy is available to push the water up over an obstacle. So delta Z could be so tall that potentially it causes choking. And what I mean by choking is that if that obstacle is so tall, there may not be enough energy at one to push the water up over it. We'll look at a specific energy diagram and see how that addresses the idea of choking here in a minute. But just one of the ways that you need to think of the energy at one is it's the energy that can push the water over this step or some other obstacle, like if a, uh, if a big boulder falls into the stream and is blocking the channel, the water's going to have maybe enough energy to get over that obstacle, and maybe uh, it will choke, meaning that the water pools upstream of the obstacle until there's enough energy to push it up over the obstacle. Okay, Because of this delta Z, the step, the specific energy is changing. So the energy at 2 is how much energy there was at 1 minus the step elevation. But the total energy doesn't change. Because remember, total energy is how much energy there is relative to a datum. And so if we use the same datum to measure both the water depth and the velocity head at 1 and 2, um, the total energy hasn't changed even though the specific energy does. Total energy takes into account the delta Z, whereas specific energy is always measuring how much energy there is relative to the bottom of the channel. Uh, now here's our specific energy diagram. And let's just say that at location one, conditions were subcritical. So we've gone through the process before of saying we have some initial depth Y1, 
we go over to the specific energy diagram and we find out how much specific energy there is. A step up means that we're losing specific energy to the magnitude of E2. And then we go up and there's two crossover points, one of which is supercritical root, one of which is subcritical root. And since we had subcritical conditions at one, we choose the subcritical depth for location two. So that's the utility here of our specific energy diagram. But now, think about what if delta Z was really large? We can go only as far as the amount of energy that corresponds to the critical depth. But delta Z can't be any further to the left of that. Otherwise, there's no longer a new depth that would work for location two. So delta Z is moving to the left. And this kind of shows us how big the step could be. So if you've got a certain amount of specific energy, the step delta Z could go as far as intercepting the critical depth. But any delta Z larger than that, and you're going to have choking or pooling upstream. But in this particular case, um, the depth decreased at location 2 because we had subcritical conditions. Now, if you've got supercritical conditions and there's a step, um, what's going to happen is a little bit counterintuitive as far as the depth goes. So if we had our initial depth, supercritical conditions is going to be in this zone below the critical depth in the specific energy diagram. So we have Y1 intersect, find our specific energy, and then we lose some specific energy, moving to the left, and we have our new E2. But then you go and you find your um, correct alternate depth, because you know here there's a specific energy um, that's associated with two different depths. There's the supercritical depth and the subcritical depth. And since we're supercritical at 1, it'll stay supercritical at 2. But it actually, the water got deeper after it flowed over this obstacle. So there will be a reduced velocity at location 2. The Froude number would be lower. It would be less supercritical than it was at 1. But the depth actually gets deeper because of having to flow over this obstacle in view of it having less specific energy. Still in the supercritical range, but the new depth is greater than the old one. OK, um, let's just review the calculation process. This is kind of a step-by-step -step procedure that we need to, you know, even if you're not punching the numbers into the calculator, I think it's useful to go through the step-by-step -step process of how do you find the new depth after some sort of a change. So this scenario, we've got a rectangular channel which we like because it makes it easy to calculate the critical depth um, since we can use the flow per unit width assumption. We've got a step up. Here you can see at location 1, the water channel was lower than at location 2. There's a 0.5 step up. So the bottom of the bed is half a foot higher than it was at location 1. So our amount of specific energy at 2 is the amount of specific energy at 1 minus the step. Now, one of the first steps we're going to go through in the calculations is we're going to assess the flow regime at 1, meaning is it supercritical or is it subcritical? Because when we find a cubic root, we're going to want to know whether we should select the supercritical or the subcritical depth for location 2. So since we have a rectangular channel, it'll be easy for us to calculate the critical depth and then compare the flow depth at 1 to our critical depth at location, well, critical depth for these flow conditions. So that's the process I'm going to illustrate here. I'm just going to bring these calculations up on screen uh, uh, because we've got several examples I'd like you to lay eyes on today, and we have to kind of speed through them, unfortunately, where I don't think that there would be a, enough time for you to do the calculations rather than just looking at them for today. OK. So yeah, this is the step up. Q is 250 CFS. We've got a half foot step. So our first thing to do is assess the flow regime at location 1. So you can see I've calculated the flow per unit width. So 
It's the 250 cubic feet per second divided by the 10 foot width of the channel. So 25 feet squared per second. And now that we've got the flow per unit width, we can calculate the critical depth using this rectangular only formula. And it's 2.69 feet. So the depth at one, we were given the information that the depth of one was five feet. So since the depth at one is greater than the critical depth, that means that it's subcritical conditions at location one. Okay, so now we've assessed the flow regime. We're going to look at the specific energy at one versus the specific energy at two. So the specific energy at one is the flow depth plus the velocity head. And in this particular case, I'm saying the velocity head is V squared divided by 2G. Because we've already got the velocity of 5 feet per second. So there's 5.388 feet of energy at location 1. Now remember from our situation here that the specific energy at 2 is going to be lower than the specific energy at 1 because of this step. So the delta Z is going to reduce how much specific energy is available at location 2. So here what I'm saying is this 4.88 feet of energy is how much of the energy that was at 1 remains after we take out the energy that's lost to the step. So the 0.5 feet has been subtracted from how much energy there was at 1. And so this is the specific energy at 2, 4.88 feet, is equal to the depth and the velocity head. And now, for the velocity head at location 2, I don't know the velocity v because I don't know the depth. So I'm expressing now the velocity head at location 2 in terms of q squared divided by 2g a squared. So I've substituted in, for example, 250 for q. Area is just the width of the channel, 10 feet, multiplied by the unknown depth, y. So uh, all of the numbers that go into this, like 32.2 for g, the uh, 250 squared in the numerator, and so on, what we end up with now is 4.88 on the left equals y, uh, y2, and then 9.705 divided by y2 squared. Now, we do a little bit of algebra to rearrange this in terms of a cubic equation. So multiply each term by y2 squared. So that makes this y2 cubed. That makes this just the 9.07. And then this is 4.88 times y2 squared. But move to the other side of the equation is where we get this negative sign from. So here's a cubic equation which when you put it into your solver will give you three roots for a cubic equation. There's a negative root which we can immediately throw out and then a depth which is associated with supercritical flow conditions and a depth which is associated with subcritical flow conditions. And since at location one the flow was subcritical that means that at location two the flow will also be subcritical. So we say that the new flow depth is going to be 4.383 feet. So that's the, uh, the new depth after the uh, step up. So the, the depth used to be 5 feet. Now, after the step up, it's going to be 4.383 feet. So the process is largely the same for all of these different new depth type problems. You're comparing the specific energy at 1 to the specific energy at 2, and then you're subtracting out uh, some sort of a change if it's a step up, or you're adding energy if it's a step down. OK, so any questions about that illustration on the step up? Because we've done the step down problem before spring break. OK, now. If, you, uh, if you'll recall, this formula for Froude number would allow us to calculate the top width at critical flow conditions by setting the Froude number equal to 1 for any shape. This is true. Or for a rectangular channel, we can find the critical depth by the flow per unit width, lowercase q. 
um, there's an interesting thing when you've got a rectangular channel at critical flow, the, uh, the depth accounts for two-thirds of the specific energy. And this is a very useful relationship because what it means is that we can find out how much energy there is in critical conditions by multiplying the critical depth by three halves. So what I'm saying is that uh, YC equals two-thirds of E when uh, conditions are critical. Or in other words, the amount of energy when, con when conditions are critical is 3 halves YC. So if you know the critical depth and you've got a rectangular channel, then you can determine how much specific energy there is when conditions are critical. And you may think, well, that seems like maybe an obscure case. Like how often will conditions be critical? They're critical a lot when there's choking. Like I talked earlier about what if you dropped a boulder in a stream or a, a, like a canal that's carrying water. If you drop a boulder in a stream, the water level's going to rise until there's just barely enough energy to flow over the obstacle. And it just so happens that the amount of energy that it requires to flow over the obstacle is the amount of energy that's associated with critical flow over the obstacle. So we're going to use this relationship a lot. The relationship of two-thirds of the specific energy is tied up as depth in a rectangular channel when you've got critical conditions. Now, it's bold and underlined for a reason, because it's only when it's rectangular that the relationship is critical flow is two-thirds of the specific energy. Otherwise, you'd have to calculate the specific energy um, by determining the velocity head and the depth. Because, like, we could, this simplification, it's not like this saves our life or anything. It's just, it saves a little bit of time. Because we could also say the critical energy is yc plus v squared divided by 2g. You know, we could just find out it's the depth and the velocity head. But it's just kind of a, a great coincidence that um, when you have a rectangular channel, the velocity head is a third of the specific energy, and the depth is two-thirds of the specific energy when conditions are critical. So it just it saves you from quantifying the, uh, the amount of energy in the velocity head for a rectangular channel. So for a non-rectangular channel, if you need to know how much energy is there, you just add the depth and the velocity head, rather than just multiplying the depth by 1.5. OK, so just as an illustration of how we'd apply this notion of 2 thirds, if we had a 5 meter wide rectangular channel and a flow rate of 50 cubic meters per second, then in a situation like that, the flow per unit width is 50 divided by 5. So it's going to be 10 meters squared per second. Remember, flow per unit width is Q divided by B. So 50 cubic meters per second divided by 10 meters. So it's 5 meters squared per second. Oh, I'm sorry, 5 meters wide. So 10 meters squared per second. So how much specific energy is there in this case? Um, we could find the critical depth using the flow per unit width. So the critical depth is 2.168 meters. And so the amount of specific energy is just 3 halves of that. So 1.5 times the critical depth suggests that the amount of specific energy is 3.252 meters. And as a check, we can, we can assess this the old-fashioned way. You know, like we can find what is the velocity when the water is that depth, the velocity would be 4.613 meters per second. And so if we want to find the specific energy, we add the depth and the velocity head. And that velocity head is 1.084 meters. And so you can see if you add the depth and the velocity head together, it is in fact that same 3.252 meters that for a rectangular channel, 
we're able to calculate just by multiplying the critical depth by 1.5. Just a little shortcut that occasionally we'll use. Any questions about this relationship of specific energy and critical depth? All right. So just to review, if you've got a step down, then it's the specific energy at 1 plus delta Z gives you the specific energy at 2. If it's a step up, then it's the specific energy at 1 minus delta Z is how much specific energy remains at 2. And we find the new depths by comparing the specific energy at 1 and the specific energy at 2 and then accounting for whatever the change was. And so you can see that the delta Z is a plus. If it's a step down, it's a minus if it's a step up. And ordinarily, we will know the depth at location 1 in problems like this. And so the velocity head could be V squared divided by 2G, or we could use it in terms of the unknown flow rate. But then at location 2, we won't typically know the, uh, the depth at 2. And so therefore, we won't necessarily know the velocity at 2. And so it, it's more typical for us to use this expression of the velocity head at 2. All right, so I've said that delta Z can get to some critical threshold, where if it gets too tall, it's going to cause problems and choking of the flow at 1. Choking just means that the inflow and the outflow don't equal, that temporarily you don't have steady flow. And remember, steady flow means that the flow conditions aren't changing over time. Like if suddenly delta Z got really tall, then there wouldn't be enough, water, enough energy to push the water over that hump. And so the flow velocity would decrease and the pooling would occur because there's a temporary accumulation of water upstream at location one. So let's just say that delta Z starts off small and it does change the depth a little bit. You know, Y2, is going to decrease if we had subcritical flow. And we've, we've seen that before on the specific energy diagram, why the depth is decreasing. And if delta Z gets a little bit bigger, then Y2 decreases a bit more. But now there's some critical step height. This delta Z with a subscript C, we just mean that that is the step height that is now induced critical flow conditions at location two. Critical flow is the most efficient depth. It's the depth that can convey the most amount of water for how much specific energy is available. So it's the most efficient flow depth because you're getting a lot of flow rate through with just a little bit of specific energy. But if the delta Z gets any higher, then we're kind of, uh, we're beyond the range of what can be accommodated downstream. And so pooling is going to occur at location one. Because right now, in this condition C, we are at the, uh, the minimum specific energy for that particular flow channel configuration and flow rate. And remember, when you've got critical flow, then the, uh, the specific energy is just 3 halves times the critical depth if it's a rectangular channel. All right, so now diagram D is more complicated. Look at all the extra notation on there. Now what happened from C to D is the step up got larger. Even just a little bit larger, there's going to be choking. And so here in, uh, in condition D, the water's backing up. It's pooling. This, is, this dashed line represents the original depth that it was before choking occurred. And now what they're calling Y prime 1, Y prime 1 means the new depth after choking occurred. That's how deep the water had to get to accumulate enough energy to get up over this obstacle. So E prime 1 is how much specific energy is required to get over an obstacle with the height of delta Z sub D. So the water's still flowing under conditions of uh, critical depth at 2. The interesting thing is 
you know, here in condition C, the water depth was YC. The water depth doesn't change if you increase the step height even more. The water depth stays critical. But what changes is the water depth has to pool at location one to accumulate enough energy to get over this newly increased delta Z. So when I talk about choking or pooling, what I mean is that the depth got larger and deeper upstream so that enough energy could accumulate to get up over this obstacle. Of course, we know the two-thirds, one-third re relationship at specific energy. So how much energy is needed at one? Like E prime one is what? Well, how much energy do we need at location one? We need at least the, uh, the minimum. We need E minimum plus delta Z D. That's how much energy we need there to be at location one, E prime one. We need enough energy so that we've got the specific energy required plus the delta Z D. So if you don't have this much energy at one, the water level will rise until you get that much energy at one. And then it'll stop rising because at that point, the, the flow rate over the obstacle equals the flow through the channel and there's no longer any reason for pooling. It's not that the water's thinking and like the depth decides how deep to get. It's just a reflection of continuity, the flow in versus the flow out. So if you do, if you do a little control volume or control surfaces around this obstacle, when delta Z gets too large and choking occurs, the pooling will occur until the flow over the obstacle equals the flow through the channel and then there's no more cause for accumulation upstream. Okay, so if we think about the specific energy diagram, the delta Z sub D is that case that was, if we had some initial specific energy at one, it was beyond the point that it could find a new alternate depth downstream. So it was too, too much of a step, and so there's going to be a, a new specific energy diagram once we have a greater depth at location one. Okay, so just to summarize what all this means, a step that's larger than the critical step would mean that there's not enough energy to, pu to push the water over the, uh, over the step, and so the flow will back up or pool or accumulate or choke. All of those terms are interchangeable, and they mean that there's just an accumulation of energy looking for uh, enough to get over the obstacle. So y prime one means the new upstream depth where y one was the original upstream depth before choking occurred. So let's look at this idea of some maximum step. If we have a rectangular channel and originally at location one the depth is 0.9 meters and the rectangular channel is 2.5 meters wide and we're putting a flow of 4.25 cubic meters per second through it. But then at location two, let's just say our first delta Z was 0 0.05 meters. You know, what would be the flow depth if we had a relatively minor step like that? And then let's calculate how high could the obstruction get before choking occurs. And so we're going to uh, find the delta Z max that's allowable before choking occurs. Okay, so to find the new depth when the delta Z is 0 0.05, it's the same process that we've done before. We're gonna diagnose the flow regime, find out if it's supercritical or subcritical at location one. Because when we solve the cubic equation, we're gonna have two positive roots, and we need to know whether to choose the larger of those two roots, which is the subcritical depth, or the smaller of the two roots, which is the supercritical depth. Okay, so in this example, we would find the, uh, the velocity at one because we need to find out how much energy there is at one. So the, the velocity at one, we just have the uh, flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. 
And uh, so the specific energy at one, E1, is just going to be the depth plus the velocity head. And then since this is a step up, I'm subtracting delta Z in order to find how much specific energy there is at two. So it is the flow depth of 0.9 meters plus the velocity head minus 0.5 meters. And what that tells me is that in the, the first case with that 0 0.05 meter step, the amount of specific energy at two is 1.0319 meters of, of energy. And that energy is going to go partly into the depth and partly into the velocity head. And so like this cubic equation that we have to solve is basically just telling me how much of the energy goes in which place. Some of it into the depth, some of it into the velocity head. And so here's y2, the unknown depth. Here's the velocity head, which is going to be solved in terms of the unknown y2. And since the channel width is 2.5 meters, you can see for area, I'm just <laughs> saying it's 2.5 times y for the area. And now the velocity head I'm expressing in terms of the flow rate, which I know 4.25 cubic meters per second. So now it's this algebraic process of rearranging the equation in terms of some cubic equation. And so I multiply each side of the equation by y2 squared. And now I've got y2 cubed minus 1.0319 y2 squared plus 0.1473. So a cubic equation which yields three roots, a negative one which we immediately discard, a root that's associated with supercritical and one that's associated with subcritical. We haven't yet diagnosed the flow regime. So to do that, probably the easiest thing since it's a rectangular channel is for us to either calculate the Froude number or compare the depth to the critical depth. In this case, I just calculated the Froude number, which was less than 1, which means it's subcritical conditions. And so we choose the larger of these two depths because it's uh, subcritical conditions. And so the water went from 0.9 meters depth to 0 0.804 meters because of that 0 0.05 meter step. Okay, so that's just getting some reps in on calculating the new depth when you've got a given delta Z. But the new part of this question is what is the delta Z max? Like how far could we take it before choking occurs? And how far we can take it is critical conditions. Uh, that's the point of incipient pooling. Incipient meaning just like right on the border. So the delta Z, when the delta Z is so tall that it's causing critical flow over the step, that's the maximum depth, the maximum step height that can be tolerated before choking. So the next part of this problem, I'm just saying the uh, delta Z max means that the Y2 is flowing at the critical depth. So we know we've got critical flow at 2, so what is the critical depth? is I guess the obvious question. Since it's a rectangular channel, we use the flow per unit width to determine that. So Q squared divided by G to the one third power. <clears throat> so the critical depth is 0.665 meters. Now when you have that depth, then the velocity can be determined because we know the flow rate Q, we know the width of the channel is 2.5 meters, and so you know when you have critical flow conditions, there's going to be some velocity that's known. So the energy equation is the amount of energy at one, so it's the depth and velocity head at one, the amount of energy at two, plus the delta Z max. Now I've moved the delta Z max over to the right-hand side of the equation. You know, in the past, I've said E1 minus delta Z is equal to E2 for a step up. This is the same thing. I've just moved the delta Z over to the right-hand side of the equation. So that's why it's plus delta Z max on that side. Uh, we just need to isolate it somehow. So we find the amount of specific energy at 1, the amount of specific energy at 2, and the delta Z max is just the difference between the two. So in this case, 
the largest that step could get would be 0 0.084 meters. And if it goes anything beyond that, then there simply isn't enough specific energy at one to push the water up over the obstacle. And so we'd have a new depth at one. Pooling would occur. So therefore, there would be some E prime one that would need to be determined. How do you know how to calculate the last two again, or like which one to pick? Well, uh, are you talking about in the first part of the problem yeah. when we were calculating the, uh, for this one? Yeah. Okay, we've got, um, we've got three roots. We immediately throw out the negative flow depth, and now we're left with this one is the shallow depth is for supercritical flow, and the larger depth is for subcritical flow. And so we chose subcritical depth at two because at location one, the, the conditions were subcritical because the Froude number was less than one. I really need to make some examples where we've got supercritical because it, it, it may seem like we're always just choosing the larger of the two depths, but it really does, it depends on the uh, flow regime. And it's just coincidence that so far all of the examples we've worked um, have been some cri subcritical flow. We'll have some that are super eventually. Are there other questions? Okay, so let's talk more about choking. We've just, in this example, said how far you can go and just be right on the verge of choking. But let's kind of talk through the process of what happens when you've got a really tall obstacle. Um, choked flow is when there's some constriction that is causing critical flow and you go beyond it in terms of the flow depth, uh, the, the height of the obstacle being even larger. So if you exceed the maximum constriction height, then the water elevation upstream of the constriction will be affected. So we no longer have steady flow until equilibrium is reestablished. And the reason why it's significant is when there's pooling upstream, that could cause flooding, like water going outside the banks of the channel. It could mean that there are hydraulic structures or buildings that are flooded. So it's important if there's going to be some change in the water depth. So let's say water is flowing along at a depth of 10 feet, but then we drop an obstacle in that's 10 feet high. Obviously, if it was flowing normally, and then there's a, an obstacle that's the same depth as the flow, that's going to cause pooling. You know, um, so what's going to happen is the water depth is going to accumulate at one until there's enough energy for there to be critical flow over the obstacle. And like, why does it stop when the flow is critical over the obstacle? Because that's the most efficient uh, flow depth. It's the flow depth that can accommodate a certain flow rate with the, mo with the minimum specific energy. So it's just doing the bare minimum at one. It's accumulating until there's just barely enough energy to get up over the obstacle, which is critical flow. We do not have enough time to go through all of the calculations on this one, so we'll pick this up on Wednesday. Remember that between now and then, you've got the... Uh, problem 12.22 to uh, submit by Wednesday. And then we'll talk more about choking and channel changes when we get together on Wednesday.